All right, I'm recording. So welcome. Um, we worked very hard on trying to bring something to you in the midst of the pandemic. And uh, my colleague, John Tilford, and I, who's here as well, love John, um, we uh, hemmed and hawed over whether or not an exhibition would happen in person. Uh, and we realized, I'm sorry? I hear someone there. Is that Bill? Um, we, we weren't sure if it would happen. And again, if anyone uh, could just mute. Oh. Yeah, let me just do that for him. There we go. Um, we, um, early this year, uh, we never planned to pull the plug on these shows. We didn't do that. Instead, we kind of doubled down. And uh, UGA graciously allowed us to borrow Rafina Tamayo's works. Princeton had approved our loans and the loans which inspired this talk, very excited to get on the radar of, of the Firestone Library and to try to, um, uh, to get some loans from them. Uh, lots of approvals, lots of things needed, a courier and all that. And then on the, on the very, very last minute, uh, unfortunately, they, de they determined that we would have to have the exhibition in person. Virtual wasn't, wasn't good enough. I appreciate that, so they declined. Um, but at least we've got the door open to coming back to that. And, but the uh, Air Mexican, uh, illustrated by Rafino Tamayo, written by Benjamin Perre, is uh, what inspired the talk that Dr. Lutz has kindly agreed to do today. That is enough from me, other than I will tell you Dr. Um, Nick Meyer is going to do a talk on December 4th, Friday. And um, uh, I would love it if you would come back for that. So we've got, this is the second in our series for the fall. Okay, Dr. Lutz, if you'd take it away. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, glad to be with you today. I will, I thought I would start by uh, explaining uh, how I proceeded in um, preparing this lecture today. Uh, when I learned that we would, uh, at the time we thought we would have the illustrations for the poem, the long poem by um, Benjamin Perret, uh, Air Mexicain from 1952, uh, illustrated by Rufino Tamayo. I have to say, as a, um, a professor of French, uh, I knew of Perret. I did not know of uh, Tamayo, and it's been a pleasure to um, learn more about him. But my lecture today will focus on the French poet and his relationship to Tamayo, and so I would urge all of you to uh, come back in December to uh, got the compliment uh, that will be, uh, I think, uh, more focused on Tamayo as an artist. I heard of Benjamin Perret when I was a um, graduate student uh, and even earlier. Um, his name certainly comes up uh, among surrealists, but uh, he's not uh, certainly as widely known as André Breton uh, or um, Louis Arago. Uh, and um, I remember having a poetry class, or it was actually a, um, a class uh, on um, analyzing poetry from a linguistic perspective. And I remember the issue coming up, well, we've learned these techniques and uh, what shall we do now? And I remember our professor, who was also my mentor, saying, well, go out and just read the poetry. And one of the names of people to read was Perret. Uh, so I'd read some Perret, and I was uh, therefore drawn to uh, returning to uh, uh, his poetry. And uh, in preparing the lecture, learned uh, a great deal about him. Um, I think I will start with maybe one reason that we uh, know him less well than somebody like um, some of the other poets and writers associated with the Surrealist movement. And that has to do with him breaking with the Surrealist movement um, in um, uh, 
the uh, middle of the 1940s uh, when he was uh, living in Mexico. And uh, his, um, uh, his, uh, the reason for that um, was um, that he um, did not want a uh, political, uh, both um, Aragon and Bouton had become members of the Communist Party, as he had, um, and uh, despite being a um, radical uh, throughout his young life and being in prison a number of times, um, he um, criticized in the middle of the 40s the uh, political um, connections of these um, other poets and writers and therefore was uh, pretty much ostracized. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, when you do a lecture, things develop as you go along. And so I certainly am going to mention the um, Aztec um, god uh, Quetzalcoatl, um, and, but more importantly, um, Aztec culture uh, and the commitment of this French poet, uh, Benjamin Perret, to um, uh, giving pre-Columbian um, culture its just due. He really dedicated his life to that. Um, so, uh, and, and the main part of my lecture will be, uh, so uh, he, um, <laughs> he's, he's put in prison for um, political activity by the French government um, at the time that um, the, um, that Hitler uh, invades France and um, <laughs> the French government, because the Germans are coming, um, frees him from prison. And so he's free to go and he flees the country and he wants to go to the United States. Uh, but uh, in fact, he, uh, like so many people in those early years of the of that decade, 1940-41, was not admitted. He was not admitted because of his past political activity. Uh, so with his uh, wife, who was Spanish from Spain, they go to Mexico, as a number of people did. Um, and he meets uh, Tamayo. And um, as far as I can tell, I think the interest in pre-Columbian um, predates that arrival in Mexico that sort of surprises me why he would want to go to the United States in the first place, especially with a wife from Spain. But anyway, they, uh, out of um, uh, necessity, end up in Mexico. And uh, that is where he uh, lives through the 40s. He comes back to France. And what is uh, interesting is that uh, then in 1952, so he's back in France. It's at that time that he um, writes this uh, uh, significant poetic work on the um, pre-Columbian uh, culture and draws on his experience in Mexico. And even though he's not in Mexico anymore, uh, it is uh, Tamayo who will uh, illustrate um, the uh, volume that comes out in 1952. So the easiest way that I found to get at this was um, the poetry is, I'm going to give my judgment here, um, extraordinary, moving, superb, dense, difficult, and very surrealist. Um, and it's interesting, I, I've sort of been thinking, you know, the surrealist movement's one of those movements that ended up having an influence that 
maybe is um, you far away from what their initial purposes were and isn't all that authentic. But uh, I just, especially the past couple of weeks, I was watching television in the, the, in the uh, yesterday evening and heard um, commentators talk about the current situation we're in as being surreal. You know, I mean, that seems to be something we will say, you know? Uh, and um, Perret uh, was involved with, the, um, with most of the projects of the surrealist in leading up to um, his departure from France. So in the 1930s, uh, he was born in 1899 and he, um, uh, in particular, uh, I think of importance is that he was involved with their automatic writing project. And I think this automatic writing project can be misunderstood because uh, easily, it's sort of a little bit like abstract art. Um, it may be that the idea is that, uh, oh, anybody can do it. You just throw paint on the canvas. Uh, you just come up with whatever it is that occurs to you. Uh, and there you have uh, poetry. Um, it's so much more complicated than that and so much and so difficult to um, articulate. But having gotten closer to his poetry this week um, and the past couple of weeks, um, I would say that um, this automatic writing project, I think, opened him up to a, um, a view of um, his surroundings and himself that um, immediately I think you're going to recognize as surreal, but it's by no means, but it no means is a matter of um, simply um, um, nonchalantly putting some kind of text together. On the contrary, the more I look at the, and so one of the ways that I felt that I could get at this was um, translating. I couldn't find, uh, understandably, this has not been translated into English. Uh, it's been translated uh, into uh, Spanish, um, sort of understandably with the connections with French. Uh, and of course to Mayo. Um, and what I, you know, you, you come to, I've done my, much of my research is on poetry and I've, um, I've done some translating of poetry. And uh, of course, you, if you succeed with a translation, you come to know the original work uh, extremely well, or you should. And what struck me with um, this long poem that's about um, uh, 14 pages and is in, one could maybe call it a prose poem. It has no punctuation apart from um, uh, capital letters, which sort of create sentences. It is one long stanza, if you like, apart from a sort of coda that is a bit like maybe sort of a quatrain at the end. Uh, and what, having studied the poem, what struck me the most was the way that it ends and the sort of um, message it um, carries. And it is an angry, um, um, engaged, um, pleading for the indigenous people of Central America and what has happened to them. Um, and it will have these kind of waves of being more positive and being more negative and will and has brighter and much darker moments. Um, and so uh, what I thought I would do is share my screen with you so that I think that I could just read this, but I think you'd have trouble sort of following. I can tell you that 
you know, French is a very demanding language in terms of structure and uh, uh, agreement of uh, adjectives and um, uh, verbs. And I mean, there, you know, you have to know, you have to know what you're doing. And he very, you know, I had no trouble putting together what he was saying at the same time that one could spend a great deal of time trying to figure out what he's saying in almost every line, if that makes any sense to you. Um, so I thought I would just share this, uh, it will take me a little while, I thought I'd share this, it's the end of the poem, and you can follow along with me. I thought that would be helpful. So let me see if I can share this text with you. This is my translation. It's the very end of the poem. There we go. Everyone see that? All right. So I am going to read, and of course, I have worked on this. Hopefully, my reading will um, um, help you make sense of what's going on here. Um, and I wanted to, let me find my notes here. I wanted to, well, one God that will come up in addition to um, the uh, serpent god uh, Quetzalcoatl is uh, Tlaloc, spelled T-L-A-L-O-C. You'll see it in the, uh, it will come up uh, later on in our poem there. And uh, he is also an Aztec god. He's the god of rain, fertility, and water, uh, giver of life and sustenance. And uh, when I was looking him up on the internet, um, I thought it was really interesting that there is a restaurant in Athens, Georgia that is named uh, Tlalo. Um, and uh, let's see, two other things that I wanted to, so I, I don't want to break the poem once I get into it. Um, we get a mention of um, uh, revolutionary Mexican figures two of them, Borges um, and Zapata. I think Zapata is fairly well known as the revolutionary, Borges really also, he was the president who um, confronted the um, emperor Maximilian put in place by um, the French uh, emperor uh, Napoleon III, which is quite striking for a French poet to take on um, French, um, occupation of Mexico in the 19th century in the way that he does. And these, both of these names are become really significant toward the end of the poem. So with that said, so uh, the poem has already been going on for 12 pages. And I thought this is a place where we can, where we could move a, a way to insert ourselves into the, uh, um, the discourse. Uh, the other thing is um, you will see a lot of uh, reference to uh, Christian imagery, and this is clearly a um, critique of, of what happened with the uh, conquistadors and the past history of Mexico and Latin America. So let us begin here. The hesitant night of desire has failed six times to recognize the rejuvenating homage of a flame breaking its shell and only burning for the milky serpent and those belonging to it. The foreigners have only lighted funeral pyres for those that the sun enchants with flights puffing with laughter, which greet the frog wearing itself out to feed them, fearing the waking of the giant who snores under the mountains, keeping it safe from the high winds that were sweeping the earth so that Tlaloc finds repose. That they return straddling the multiplied jaws at the bottom of the waves where the sun rubs its eyes, the whites of communal wafer light down have with water entered into the heads, the rodent mole of hunger and the whip of the master 
fed with dead Indians. And of the white woman who is surprised to see herself in a lake like the valleys formed while seating herself by the lords of the earth or the heavens, each ear of corn and each tongue brings forth an air of liberty burning brighter than that of the deserts dried up by the summer tyrants so that the foreigner can sharpen an appetite of vulture. A chant which tears away the encircling rings of the slaves, astonished to breathe the light, carries away the galley like a bull drowned and hunting the obscure peat soil of crucifix strokers provokes the burning ardor these creatures recognize. The air will be clearer if only by not echoing the voices without spy nor constraint. The water will be more limpid if only by reflecting faces without anguish or sin. The snow of the peaks climbing the clouds will be more shattering by having been trampled only by steps without hindrance. The roads that no longer lead to the silence of the starving tombs, but to the games of birds crying with sun. The springs will no longer ever sing the laments of the eternally condemned, but will roar with a fulsome laughter at spring. The corn will soar higher, having not had to lower its head like a Christ giving way under the burden. Even the gold will be pure, having faced only smiles in disturbing the nights swept by warm and starry breezes of kisses. Unfortunately, those who smell the porridge are in the mountains which hide the slumber of gold high above hearing ring that which is down below. The foreigner with the bloated spongy facade has proven to the people that a reflection of luminous venomness can massacre in order to people with slaves the eternal lives of the handlers of crosses. And someone with hand with no will of the wisps, despite the interminable fermentations that burst to the surface, open for them the gates of daggers between two shoulders. From the snatched head, as a tree carried away by a tornado is mastered by a straitjacket, will flee toward the sterilizing north the joyful secrets jealously guarded by the opaque genies of heavy darkness and the fruits ceaselessly renewed of a union which calls forth torrents of tears of elation and the body torn apart by a distrusted bull's fury, but which once to recover a day delivered from mists of suspect, suspect cupping glasses, wait for Juarez to delouse and disperse the black flights oozing Latin. Nothing is to be done. He who lives by the sun making the charge has become a subterranean champion for the rats of the earth. And the earth is dying of hunger while a toad swells up all the way to believing himself to be the general of pustules. But the voice of a dazzled lark rises from the gagged soil to demand that the lark gates, locked gates of executions be opened like the sea to the horizon, which lights up for a feast of equals. Disengaged from a heart crushed by an anguish with no imaginable dawn, it flies off as an avalanche which makes beat even the veins of marble and echoes with thunder, filling up the valleys, suddenly astonished by their peace is that, suddenly astonished that their peace is that of polished bones. The forests of leaning heads stand up and light up of glances that explode in summary justice, and all the huts of dried misery shelter a being that condenses into man. Life can no longer be a crawling, blessed by providences, complicit 
with the furrow of rowing galley slaves bludgeon into the skeleton deprived of reanimation, since each furrow likened to a brand new Zapata coin makes the never completely ripe harvest rise of disinherited voices. Unfortunately, nothing but a scattered tomorrow, the lightning. Here they are who return, the barbarous shadows with dollar faces and serial numbers. Look at them gnaw away the rocks which carry shame on their forehead, gnaw the earth which they would like to dissolve, gnaw man all the way to the heart which they make reek. Um, so maybe you'd agree with me that that's pretty powerful stuff. Um, and there's much that can be uh, said about it. I think um, that it, uh, it, you do have the reference to uh, Quetzalcoatl, um, the uh, serpent god. Um, and um, I guess what occurs to me is, what's really interesting, um, so um, let me go back to um, Perret's um, biography here. And I've gotten a good bit of this. I, I went to several sources, but I especially liked uh, allpoetry.com, a great site for, for poetry if you're interested. And I'm gonna share some of what they share with you. Uh, they what they um, uh, provide here. Um, so the Surrealists began to call for social action. In 1926, Perret, along with Eduard Aragon and Breton, joined the Communist Party. Um, then um, uh, at, uh, from, um, and from 1924 to 1925, Perret works with um, Pierre Naville, in editing um, La Révolution Surréaliste. Eventually, he takes charge of the magazine. Um, and um, he soon leaves the Communist Party to join with Trotskyist opposition. And there are Mexican connections there. Um, he um, is, um, but he will break with the, um, uh, uh, with the other Surrealist in 1940, um, let's see. Um, um, I'm uh, don't uh, okay. So um, what I what I wanted to say there was that um, uh, I think that with a poem like this, this is this is a poem. <laughs> with a, um, a poetic, calling for a poetic, a co calling for a revolution that poetry can create, not politics. Um, and in that way, he connects with a very um, notable strain of French poetry that certainly is most of modern poetry in France and much of the Western world, um, goes back to Baudelaire, uh, but in particular to uh, Rimbaud and has the notion of the, the poet as seer, as prophet, as um, a guiding voice, um, but a voice that doesn't, that uh, um, um, where the, the revolution is the poetry itself. And yet with the kind of dense poetry that I've shared with you um, today, um, it, um, <laughs> You know, it's um, it's not so clear that that changes society, and yet I've done a good bit of work on Haitian culture, and um, I think it's really interesting that um, uh, uh, toward the end of World War II, uh, André Breton, pretty much the leader of the Surrealist movement, was in um, Haiti. Um, 
in contact with young radical uh, poets and writers. Uh, and all of them had this notion that some kind of revolution uh, created by the poetry would be um, possible. And that was really one of the um, key uh, notions of um, the surrealist uh, movement. And so in that way, I think that um, Perret uh, is a uh, very um, um, representative, perhaps especially representative, perhaps more representative of surrealism than maybe some of the uh, better known um, figures. So um, I think to conclude, what I thought I would do is that of all things, in 1952, when he's writing this incredible poem, Air Mexicain, um, he also is um, participating in a film about the um, god Quetzalcoatl um, that goes back to the 16th century Codex Borgia. Um, and um, I found a, a nice little um, couple minute um, YouTube um, short about the Codex. And then I thought I'd just show you the first few minutes of this um, film where he narrated the uh, film that was uh, directed by Michel Zimbacca, Z-I-M-B-A-C-C-A, -A, um, on the, which tells the story of the god uh, uh, Quetzalcoatl, and that's when I put together my uh, topic for the um, lecture and thought I might be uh, focusing more on this um, particular god who, in this uh, story in the Codex, um, it's, it's, among other things, the story of the origin of humans and how this god, this serpent, feathered serpent god comes down from the heavens and uh, uh, is responsible for um, the beginning of uh, humanity. Um, and um, it's really, and the, the film has um, images from the uh, codex and um, authentic music and you get to hear the voice of Perret. So I thought we'd also see a few minutes of that and then I'd be glad to, to the extent I can, answer some questions or uh, enter into um, discussion with you. So um, what Dr. Uh, Dr. Lutz, may I interrupt for one moment? I, I just wanted to let everybody know I'm putting into the chat a link to the page uh, for Princeton and the Firestone Library. So if you're interested in seeing the illustrations, you can, you can take a look at that later. If you click on it, you'll save it. Thank you. Thank you. So let me see what I need to do here. Uh, let's see. Well, I'm not finding the, um, well, let's see. Both of them have disappeared when you try to cue these things. It will take me just a minute to uh, bring them up. Um, let's see. Um, um, okay. Um, Okay, I, it's coming up. Okay, uh, now let me go back and share my screen with you all. What are these? Let's see. Here we go, got it. 
And let's see. All right, here we go. All of you see this? Here we go. This is the short. Okay, let me, uh, it's giving me problems here with a minute to get control. Okay, let me try and go back here. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, and let me bring up the uh, short film. Uh, we'll watch just a bit of it. Uh, I'm sorry, I had this queued, but I don't know where it went. There we are. Everyone see it? Maybe, did you not see it? Uh, we could see it and we could hear it, yep. Okay. Yeah. All right, back I go. The music is of the these Indians that you see noted there. Dans ce miroir d'obsidienne, un dieu aztèque lisait tous les événements du monde. C'est Escatlipoca, au visage strié de nuit, maître et magicien du ciel nocturne. Le peuple aztèque, en observant le ciel, lisait lui aussi dans le noir miroir de son dieu. En suivant la course des planètes et en calculant leur révolution, il participait aux aventures mythiques de ses principales divinités. Leurs temples étaient aussi des observatoires. Sous forme de la planète Vénus, tour à tour étoile du soir et étoile du matin, lui apparut son dernier héros civilisateur, Quetzalcoatl, le serpent plumé. Dieu de la mort et de la renaissance, le périple qu'il accomplit dans le domaine souterrain de Tezcatlipoca, avec lequel il entre en lutte, est la principale partie de sa geste. Décrite en image dans le codex Borgia, elle nous dévoile par son symbolisme une des interprétations les plus passionnantes de la nature et de l'homme que nous aient laissé les grandes civilisations. Le soleil éclaté, l'homme serpent en plume a été projeté sur la terre. Mayoel, la troublante fée de la cave, vient lui donner le jour. Qu'il boit quatre fois à son sein pour vivre parmi les dieux. Quel fin corps qui offre son sang aux divinités car c'est leur eau précieuse. Pour les Aztèques, les sacrifices sont indispensables à la marche de l'univers. Dans la fontaine d'eau précieuse, quel fin corps se sacrifie pour que son sang alimente les protecteurs des plantes qui, à son défaut, parliraient et mourraient. Le monde dont cet arbre symbolise le centre est né du sacrifice des dieux. So I will stop there. Uh, what, uh, where that concluded was that uh, the world, the monde, was being um, uh, 
uh, created by the sacrifice of the gods. And the first part of it talked about the descent of the god Quetzalcoatl uh, down to, um, from, from the heavens. Um, and I think with that, I will um, thank you for your attention. And uh, again, I'd be glad to uh, ask, uh, uh, to uh, have a discussion and answer questions to the extent that I can. I want to thank you for that translation. Um, I, in my very, very, very rudimentary Spanish and maybe a little less rudimentary French, I tried to translate a little bit. It was so dense and so confusing. And now I realize I was doing a pretty good job because it was very dense and confusing and surrealist. Like that doesn't make any sense line to line. But as you read it, my goodness, what a beautiful translation. It, it really is very, very moving. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, that was, I didn't know what to do. I had the same reaction you. I couldn't figure it out. And I said, well, and then once I started looking at it, I had no problem figuring out what he was talking about at any point, even though it seemed, I mean, these images are so, you know, surreal that um, at the same time. Um, so it's this strange, combination of sense. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's, you know, I guess what I'd like to suggest is this is this is the poet screaming justice for these people instead of going out and marching on the street or becoming part of a political party or something. And and he was ostracized for that. Honestly, I'm, I'm very excited to, to share this video with the artist whose work is you know, alongside Tamayo right now in, in uh, Uma, Tina Tavera, who's, you know, um, one part political activist and one part printmaker. I think she'll really dig it um, because she, it, you know, it does speak to some of what she, she deals with as well in her work. Really, really, really moving. I'm excited about it. There must be some questions. I know we're all zoomed out. Please, anybody. I have a question. Well, uh, there we go. Oh, sorry, go Dr. Collins. No, Hi, no, everybody. Right um, Hi, everybody. I'm Laura King. I am an Oglethorpe alum, and I'm like super jazzed to like be with um, Dr. Collins and Dr. Mar and Dr. Lutz again. Um, we've all aged since then. <laughs> but I was so excited um, to attend this today, and I was so jazz that you brought up the point of poetry as revolution. Um, full disclosure, I, I was a protege of Dr. Marr and dictatorship and democracy in Latin America. So this is my jam. Um, but it just reminded me of what Neruda talked about, <laughs> about, um, you know, poetry could fill stadiums, right? And it was part of the revolutionary movements in the 60s to 80s in Latin America. And, you know, I'm reminded of what he said, you know, poetry doesn't belong to those who write it, but to those who read it. And when we put that over into like a Mexican context, we actually can meld like Octavio Paz, who was both a politician and a poet who happened to write extensively on Tamayo, right? And so he kind of summed it up as like, what Tamayo was doing with his art was both a history and a revisioning of Mexican identity that could be used as a revolutionary act itself. And he summed it up in one word and that was like transfiguration. And so I'm wondering if you're in your exploration of um, Benjamin Pere, if there was some kind of central theme or word that he ended up landing on for his exploration of this. Good question. Good to see you, Lord. Um, you too. Um, uh, I would think, I don't know if it is uh, so much a word as maybe a concept of, um, of rebirth that would parallel the descent uh, to earth of uh, Quetzalcoatl mm -hmm. uh, that one could sort of 
start over. I was sort of talking about how it goes back and forth between waves. You get those nice parts where you get the lark, you get the, the freed slaves. And then um, I didn't want to break up the poem, but I might go back to just the very end of the poem. The only break in the whole poem is before those very last lines. And so we're sort of eased into something more positive, and then it's just, you know, smack in the face there with those final lines. The barbarians are there, they're, they're gnawing away, um, they're making everything sting. Um, and... Yeah, it was a very also like Neruda way to end a poem. It reminds me of his writings that he did about, you know, the United Fruit Company of corporate colonization in the Americas. Like the last line of his poems are like, uh, the carrion in the field, fruit laden and foul. You know, leaves nothing to the imagination. It's, I think, that equivalent of I said what I said. I think um, I could mention a, a few details of just some suspicions I have. If in the film with uh, Quetzalcoatl, um, there is talk of the points of the compass. They seem to have symbolic meaning of the, the north, south, east, and west. And so when I first, uh, you maybe didn't catch this line where he says, um, from the snatch head as a tree carried away by a tornado is mastered by a straitjacket, will flee toward the sterilizing north. Um, that might well be the north, uh, the United States, uh, but I think it could be, I think it could also be viewed in a kind of uh, symbolic kind of way. He, he capitalizes uh, M and maybe having to do with the ascent and descent of the, uh, of the God also. Um, so there are, you know, uh, I, I, um, I would have been tempted to constantly uh, interrupt the poem and um, comment, but I think it would have ruined the poetry for you. So, uh, <laughs> so I, chose, I chose not to do that, which is not to say that um, I um, couldn't talk about it at some length. Uh, also, as a translator, a few things, maybe I'll, I'll give you a couple lines that really gave me trouble. Um, oh, and I wanted to mention that, uh, let me mention a couple things. In the very beginning of the poem, uh, I learned that uh, the frog is a um, Aztec, um, an, an important animal for uh, the Aztecs, and you get, and in this uh, very um, positive opening where you get the description of the people, the sun enchants with flights, puffing with laughter, which greet the frog, wearing itself out to feed them. Um, and then uh, what I really had trouble with, uh, uh, so another animal that comes up uh, is the, in French, the taupe, which is the mole, M-O-L-E. But it just doesn't work so well in English. I, you know, I mean, it works, but you have to know, it's not like, you know, um, it could easily go by and you could not catch that it's the animal. So I added rodent to it. Um, and of course I had to make a few changes here and there, but, and, and also, um, so you've got the sun rubbing its eyes and then it's just sort of in apposition like whites, the whites of, and I didn't quite know how to get this across, but what he is saying is the white is like the polish of the communion wafer. <laughs> so, so I wrote, um, the whites of communal wafer-like down, down, that is like down of a duck, you know, have with water entered into the heads, that is pushed into the heads, not, you know, like uh, forcing. 
entered into the heads, what? The rodent mole of hunger and the whip of the master fed with, and then, you know, very strong, a line all on its own, dead Indians. It's just, it's very strong, it's very strong stuff once you get into it. And I, I did, um, I, I did my best. It took me, you know, I, I was preparing this last night and over and over again, unhappy with my reading. I had to go back and change the translation and, and change the rhythm. <laughs> but I think I finally got to the point where at least I think I understood what I was saying, which, you know, is helpful. <clears throat> We still have time for, for more uh, questions, but I'm also going to pop something into the chat about Dr. Marr's talk so that you don't, because I think Lori, alum, you would like to come to this too. <laughs> oh, I've already got it on my calendar. Excellent. Without okay. question. When, right, when I saw these two talks in the alumni newsletter, I was like, yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Well, uh, oh, uh, are you going to talk or? I, I have a question for yep. the professor. Um, is the French text um, available online in any way? It is. Um, and I don't, um, what I, um, um, how can we do this so that I, I don't have it, I don't have it available right now. Um, if you go, um, uh, I could only find it going to French Google, um, but, um, can we make that available? Yeah, you know what? Once we once we post the recording, we can post links to other other uh, sources. I think that would be helpful. I've, we'll I've, I I will do that because it was not easy to find. The, it was easy to find excerpts um, and lots about it. It took me a while, but uh, it is. It's absolutely free and it's uh, it, it's good. Otherwise. Uh, uh, the the book itself is a rare book and can cost a lot of money and be hard to find and of course we were getting these the illustrated book from the Princeton Library but be glad to make that available to you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, Jay. Yes, Jay. Hi. Or you see Heather up there. That's <laughs> that's not me, of course. But I, I just want to say first of all, you know, you know, you and I have talked a lot about poetry and. Uh, Beautiful translation, by the way. Wonderful work. And I'm looking forward to uh, doing my best trying to read the French translation if I can. But hopefully uh, there's I know that you read uh, the last part of that entire and very long prose poem. Um, it's interesting. Uh, and I'm really going to make just a comment here that um, we just finished in my uh, world mythologies class our, our study of Mayan and Aztec mm -hmm. mythology. And I was wondering in that poem, uh, it'd be interesting to see whether or not um, he, um, I'm sure he does, fully incorporate some of the things surrounding Quetzalcoatl, mainly because, you know, he, he, it started off really as a Mayan god, uh, Kukulkan, and it was also called Nine Wind. Uh, and what's interesting about that is the colors you've been mentioning. He's also sometimes painted red, sometimes painted white in the art. He often has a, a cone-shaped headdress, too, that has jewels in it. And those jewels are associated with, uh, of course, uh, planets like Venus, from which apparently he derives. In fact, they thought of Venus as Quetzalcoatl. But the thing I think is really interesting about this um, is that when the Christian missionaries came in uh, and were trying to convert uh, the Aztec to Christianity, they came across, uh, like uh, Bishop Delanda and others, they came across the fact that there were symbols there that really shocked them. For example, one of the symbols of Quetzalcoatl was a cross. And another one was the <laughs> fact that he was born of a virgin. His mother was sweeping a temple and, and uh, a, a ball of dust entered her mouth and that gave, that made her pregnant, quote unquote, and she gives birth to Quetzalcoatl. Uh, and what's interesting about it is that we also have, and I don't know if he, if he uh, recognized this or maybe talked about it in the poem, but um, you know, there was that 
that idea that in, when, of course, people have heard of it, it, it's actually false information. But in 1517, Cortez comes in and everyone thinks that is Quetzalcoatl return because apparently according to one of the myth themes, one of the stories about him, one of the variants is that he was uh, sacrificed ritually uh, and then went back to Venus or became Venus and would return again, a kind of a Christ-like story. But in fact, uh, we have, I think some scholars have discovered that that was uh, just uh, a hyped up story by uh, historians later, uh, that in fact, uh, that was not the case, that Cortez, when he came in, was mis mistaken for <laughs> the return of Quetzalcoatl. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there's a number of really interesting issues and I'm wondering if, if he addressed any of those things in the longer poem, if you've had a, I'm sure you've read the whole poem. What do you think? Um, I, I think he no doubt does. Um, and in fact, uh, I was just, I felt I could make the most effective presentation by this sort of um, passionate plea at the end. Mm. Much of the poem is sort of preparing that uh, with reference to uh, Quetzalcoatl. Uh, and at one point, as I was looking at, one thing that I was looking up is that he refers to uh, what I guess is a bird in Central America, the Quetzal. Uh, That's right. Uh, and uh, he, uh, there are other references to uh, the frog, uh, to uh, Tlaloc, um, uh, frequent references to the um, feathered serpent, which is why I put that in the um, in the title. Um, but um, the entire poem is just as dense as what I shared with you, and you've got maybe I don't know twenty percent of it. So um, there would be a lot to. Um, to unpack there. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, if I may, I'll, I'm going to sort of piggyback on what um, Jeffrey said. And, and Jay, when you, you said that um, if you were to pick a word or a concept, it would be rebirth. And then you sort of treated us to the ending where this idea that there's a break and then from the north there's these sort of you know like essentially new barbarians um it strikes me that in aztec in the cardinal directions for aztecs are connected with deities mm -hmm. um north is connected with tezcatlipoca who is essentially a kind of consistently an adversary of quetzalcoatl okay um, and and is actually the one who tricks him it's a long story that I'm sure Jeffrey knows, but to get him essentially to self-exile as a punishment. But he is, um, and, and the, like one of the many different variants is that the idea was that if there, were, if there was too much sacrifice, human sacrifice, he would come back. Quetzalcoatl was not a fan of human sacrifice. Um, and so there's, the idea that there's going to be these sort of repeated cycles and that the contest between Quetzalcoatl, I think, is connected with the West because he goes West. He goes off to where he, he's from, which is West, and apparently that's Venus. And, um, but he might return from the West. Um, if he does, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to basically piss off Tetzcatlipoca, who is who is, is in some ways a more powerful god. He's the god of the here and now. He's the god... He is the god of chaos. He is the god of disease. He is the god of all things that are gritty, real, disturbing. Um, and so I think the poem may actually be sort of connecting to this idea that there are these sort of cycles in Mexican history, which include now mm -hmm. the North, the United States probably, as Tetzcatlipoca, and kind of trying to blend these two, sort of the historical reality and the myth. That's just sort of I haven't read the poem except for what you've read to me, but that's offhand seems like kind of what that probably is about. So I'm, it's not really a question. I guess I'm just throwing a, two cents in. That makes good sense to me. And um, uh, I had thought at one point of uh, spending time with the film and detailing it for you. 
But what I can tell you is I've, I've watched it enough to know that it does a lot with these compass points as related to the gods and comes from the Codex Borgia. Um, All right, I also do have a question, which is um, just from what uh, Elizabeth shared, that kind of the, the Princeton images, just looking at Tamayo's images, which in some ways a little bit different from the stuff I, I typically associate with his style. Um, when, when you're reading the poem and looking at those accompanying illustrations, do you see it like, a, what, what, is, what is the connection you make in your mind when you're looking at Tamayo's work juxtaposed to this poem? Yeah, um, I think, I would suggest that he is sort of um, sensing presence of this history of divinity uh, and letting himself then respond to it in his own way. Uh, one of the, we could, um, we could bring up the um, illustrations. Um, could we, could you, could you share the screen? With sure, you? you want me to do that? Yeah, please. Okay. Because uh, one of them is, is, I think, pretty clearly the feathered serpent, you know. Um, yeah, great. Um, Let me just scroll that up. Scroll down a little bit, yeah. There. <laughs> there. You, see the, you see the serpent there, pretty clearly. And clear. then on, on the right looks like a, uh, looks a bit like a glyph, right? Like a mime glyph. Yes. And if you go to the others, if you keep going, so that's the title page, the next one, there we go. I don't, I sort of, the three, I have trouble with this one uh, and it's not connected to a particular page. Um, so I was wondering if it might have to do with the set of animals and representation of the gods, but I'm, I'm just not sure. I've got more to say about the next one, however. Jay, wasn't there a reference to the bloated faces of the conquistadors? Could be. That, that could be. Could be. Mm -hmm. The next one is connected to part of what I translated for you. No, th not this one. Uh, this is not, but uh, this, this is um, clearly sort of um, branches, and it's connected to um, uh, to this part of the poem. If you scroll down once more, we get what I, uh, so this is the very end of the poem that I was sharing with you. You see Juarez there? Uh, Attends que Juarez um, les pouilles, waits for Juarez to delouse et disperse and disperse les vols noirs dégoulants de latin, the uh, black flights um, uh, uh, oozing Latin. Uh, and uh, so I think, uh, I think there um, it's suggestive. Um, he did choose to illustrate that very last page. Um, if, if I could. I'm just guessing here, but it looks a little bit like an eagle on a cactus to me, which is a symbol of Mexico. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. As, as you're saying that, I'm seeing three birds descending. Or it could be the eagle on the cactus, right? And there's always a moon in, in almost everything Tamayo does, right? And I guess in conjunction with what I said before, I, I think the as often with illustrators, I think he was inspired by the the poetry and then chose his own way to respond as opposed to, you know, um, specifically uh, re, uh, recasting, uh, reproducing the, uh, the narrative or a particular sequence. I'll stop the share.
Here we go. Well, any other questions? This was wonderful. You know, this this gives me a little flavor of what it's like to be in the museum because the the lectures are engaging, and then the the talk afterward is is just as enlightening, and that no different despite Corona. Here we are. I appreciate all of you so much for being here, and thank you so much, Dr. Lutz, for that translation. It was so beautiful, inspiring. I hope that you'll somehow are inspired in your free time to continue translating it. Maybe. I, this got me this got me interested. Yeah. yeah. Really, really good. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you all very much. Mark your calendars. Have a very safe and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>